Today we're going to be talking about neighbors. How many of you have a neighbor? That's right. Have you ever noticed that virtually all of the most popular TV shows and TV series have a memorable neighbor at the center of the show? Let's play a game. Let's see if you guys can name, find, recognize some of these neighbors. We're going to put them up on the screen for you. Who's the guy behind the fence? Mr. Wilson from Tim the Toolman Taylor's show. We also have this guy, Kramer, the Cosmo Kramer from Seinfeld. Who remembers this guy? <laughs> Steve Urkel. <laughs> Wasn't he a great neighbor? Yeah. Let's go to some cartoons. Even cartoons have neighbors. Remember those? Barney and Betty Rubble. Ned. Anybody remember? Flanders. Flanders. Ned Flanders. That's right. Let's go back in time a bit. Yeah, now we're talking. Now I'm speaking your language. Do you remember their names? Fred and Ethel, that's right. I put a, a, a clip of, of uh, Lucy and Ethel uh, this week uh, looking out the window, watching their new neighbors move in. That was your uh, cue or your hint as to what we were talking about this week. We've got another one for you. Who remembers her? Kimmy, that's right. Annoying Kimmy. And then here's the last one. Y'all remember these guys? Friends, they were everybody's neighbor at some point uh, in time on the show. They switched around so much, but they were each other's neighbors on and off. Neighbors are all around us, as we've already discovered. I had you raise your hand a moment ago. You said you all had them. We all know them. And just like on the TV shows, they come in all different shapes and sizes, don't they? Some of our neighbors are wise. And helpful, who's ever had a wise and helpful neighbor? That's right. Some of our neighbors are funny. Anybody ever had a funny neighbor? That's right. Some of our neighbors are annoying. Anybody had an annoying neighbor? If they're here, don't raise your hand, but. An intrusive neighbor, anybody ever had an intrusive neighbor? Yeah. Some of our, our neighbors are full of love and easily loved. Anybody had a neighbor that was just really easy to love? And then some of our neighbors are really easy to despise. Anybody ever had one of those? See, they, they come in a lot of different flavors, don't they? Neighbors do. But they are all around us. We all have them. That's the most obvious thing about neighbors is they're everywhere. But there's something less obvious that we tend to forget whenever it comes to neighbors. We don't all just have neighbors we are all someone's neighbor as well. You see, the problem with most of those neighbors that we just looked at on the TV shows that we just mentioned a moment ago is that they are all memorable for the wrong reasons, aren't they? They're memorable for the wrong things. As believers, I think we have to ask ourselves the question as neighbors, realizing that we not only have neighbors, but that we are neighbors, I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we known for? What do people think of when they think of us as their neighbors? It's part of the question I want us to consider from Luke chapter 10 this morning. I want to start reading in verse 25 so we get a fuller context of the conversation that is happening here in this text. This is a conversation between Jesus and an expert in the law. It says, then an expert in the law stood up to test him saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He asked him, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, he told him, do this and you will live. 
But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? He had to go there, didn't he? Jesus had already given him a really, really good answer, but he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to go a little further. Jesus took up the question, it says in verse 30, and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, they beat him up, and then they fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road when he saw him. He passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine, and then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend." Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers, Jesus asked. The one who showed mercy to him, he said. And then Jesus told him, go and do the same. Go and do the same. The question of who was a neighbor to the man is obvious. The answer to that question is obvious. The one who showed mercy to him is the one who was a neighbor. I think the challenge and the deeper question that Jesus is asking here is he's trying to get this man and he's trying to get us to understand not only who was a neighbor to this man, but, but how can we go and do the same What are we to do to be godly neighbors? That's why for this morning, our big idea are the words of Jesus, go and do the same. That's going to be my encouragement to you throughout this message, go and do the same. But but how do we do that? How How do we go and do the same? What is the right attitude that you should have? What is the right attitude that I should have? What is the right attitude that we should have as God's people as we engage with the neighbors around us? There are three specific attitudes I I think that are found in holy neighbors, three specific attitudes that are found in godly neighbors, three specific attitudes that we see here in our text. The first one is this, mindfulness. Mindfulness. If you want to be a a godly neighbor, a holy neighbor, you're going to have to be a mindful neighbor. I put next to the word uh, mindfulness or the blank where you're writing in mindfulness, an attentive spirit. I think that's the best way to kind of just sum up in a, a short phrase what mindfulness really is. It's somebody who has an attentive spirit. You know, the more I walk with Jesus the more I am convinced that a mindful and attentive spirit is what most disciples in the church today are missing. We are so busy. We're so stretched. We're so stressed. We are so saturated with this culture of chaos that surrounds us. We become numb in our spirit and we lose our mindfulness. We lose our attentiveness. We don't, we don't see people. We're not mindful enough to see those around us who are in need. In the story that Jesus shared, the Samaritan who is determined to be the one in the story who had the proper attitude toward his neighbor You know where he started? He started by just seeing and noticing that there was a problem. He noticed there was a problem, that there was something wrong with someone else. Someone else who had nothing to do with him, someone else he didn't know, someone else he had really no obligation to help. But he noticed, he had an attentive spirit. It says in verse 33, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him 
And when he saw the man, he had compassion. If you have your Bibles open, I would encourage you to underline or circle the word saw. He saw the man. In Greek, that word saw literally means to know by perception. It means to perceive something. Now, certainly his eyes in this story, and certainly our eyes, are very beneficial in perceiving the things that are happening around us and knowing things. But Jesus is getting at something deeper deeper here. He's getting at a spirit of mindfulness, an attentive spirit to the needs of other people. That's what makes somebody a great neighbor. And to walk in this manner as Christ would have us to walk, requires us to have a spirit of mindfulness. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 2, 3 through 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Mindfulness, an attentive spirit. He went on in verse 4 to say, everyone should look not only at his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. Mindfulness. An attentive spirit. To the Romans, he said things like this in Romans 12, 15 through 16. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. How can you do that if you're not mindful and attentive? He says in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. In Romans 15, verses 1 through 3, he says, Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us, he says, is to please his neighbor. For he is good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it's written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Helping the Corinthians understand how they could be neighbors, godly neighbors to those around them, Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 through 24. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. And then he says this, no one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. He's supposed to be mindful of what's good for everybody else. This is really where it all starts. It's, it starts with being a good neighbor, starts with being a, a mindful neighbor, having a spirit of attentiveness. If you think about the good neighbors you've had in your life, they were attentive neighbors. They were neighbors who noticed, they were neighbors who saw, they were neighbors who cared. But I think it's impossible for us to do this if we're focused on ourselves, if we're so wrapped up in our own worlds, if we're so busy, so stressed, so stretched, and so saturated by the culture of chaos, it's impossible for us to go and do the same as Jesus talks about. See, what Jesus is reminding us is that to be a good neighbor, we're going to have to be able to see other people, to see their needs, to perceive them, to notice them, And then we're going to have to put them ahead of ourselves. I'm going to give you three simple things that have helped me get better at seeing people. This has not always been my strong suit. It's something I have to work on every single day. I'm busy. I'm stressed. I'm I'm, I'm stretched. I'm saturated in the same ways you guys are. And so these are the three things that I really, I I really do work on this and I'm not where I want to be yet, but they have helped me and I think they'll help you too. They're not hard things. They're not difficult things. They're not super time consuming things, but they're things that, that help me see people. They're, they're actually things that help me in multiple areas of my life. The first one is the word pray or prayer. You need to pray. If you really want to see people the way God sees them, And the way God wants you to see them, if you really want to be a godly neighbor, you need to make sure you're praying. I've been trying to make sure that when I wake up in the morning and when I go to sleep at night, those two times in particular, along with some times in between as it comes to my heart and my spirit, but at those two times in particular, I try to spend some amount of time in my prayer asking the Lord to open my eyes, to open my ears, and to open my heart to see people around me. And I confess 
Many times in those moments, I confess my weakness in this area. I, re I repent of the things I missed the day before or the week before. I repent of those things and ask the Lord to help me to do better on that day. But I'm, I'm asking the Lord for his help to show me the people I need to see, the situations I need to understand, to help me to see the things he's calling me to help change or impact in those people's lives. And you know, just being faithful to ask God for his help here has made a huge difference and a huge impact in my life. It, it helps keep my spirit sensitive and attentive to the activity of God around me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. When you pray today, I want you to pray a bold prayer. I really do. Pray this. Put it in your notes. Tonight when you pray, ask God to help you see those you're called to serve. Pray it. Ask him to open your eyes and your heart and your ears to see those you're called to serve. The second thing I do is I pause. Pausing is so beneficial in so many different ways, but particularly when it comes to seeing people, pausing really helps. As I mentioned a moment ago, one of the biggest challenges that we have in this area of our lives is being too overwhelmed and too busy. We see this in our passage, the priest and the Levi, uh, they, they both pass by on the other side of the road. They couldn't spare the time to stop. If they came in contact with this man, particularly if he was dead, or even if he was dying, they would have to go through this long, spiritually cleansing ritual process before they could get back to their normal activities. Who's got time for all of that, right? They were busy. They had stuff to do. They were on their way to do important things. When I see or hear or sense something in my life that, that I feel like God might be opening my eyes to, I try to make time to just pause, to investigate it, to consider it. I don't always have time in the moment, but I try to make sure I come back to it that day. Not long ago, Abby was telling me about a need that she had heard of. She mentioned that she really wished we could, we could help as a family, not as a church, but she said, I, I just wish we could help them with this. I really think we, we, we could help with that. I could tell she really felt like the Lord was in this situation and that, that it would really help the family and that we could and we should do something about it personally. But I was busy at the moment when she told me about it. and I couldn't really pause to consider it right then and there. But later that day, as I was out walking, I was praying about it, thinking about it. That evening, as I sat on my back porch, I paused again to pray and think on it some more. And I didn't hear the Lord say anything about it in those moments I paused. But I considered it again. And then that night, before I went to bed, I was praying about it pausing and thinking about it again, just asking the Lord what his will was and if he wanted us as a family to step out in faith and to help as well because it was going to require some sacrifice on our part and uh, uh, some faith on our part to be able to step into that situation. I felt like the Lord that night confirmed in my heart that we were supposed to do it. So the next morning, the first thing, one of the first things I told Abby when she woke up was that I was in agreement with her, and I felt like the Lord wanted us to help, and I asked her to go and make it happen, and she did. Honestly, if I wouldn't have had those dedicated moments to pause and to pray and to stop and to think about it, I would have missed that opportunity. And worse yet, we would have missed that opportunity as a family to help in that area. It wouldn't have been just me. It would have been our entire family that would have missed it. Man, I want to speak to you real quick. I just want to speak to the men in here, particularly those of you who are married. Can I just encourage you in this? We, we really, as men, need to do what we can to pause and pray about things so we can lead our families well. If you want to lead your family well, you're going to have to develop this discipline in your life where you pause and pray about stuff. And men, if your wife's spirit is attentive to something, can I just encourage you to listen to her? And all the women are supposed to amen. 
listen to her. At the very least, make time to pause and to pray about it. And God may move your heart into agreement with hers to help in that situation. And he may not. But as men, it's important, if we're going to lead our families well, that we're doing those things. The third thing you you can do is this. You, You have to do. You have to prioritize If we're going to be mindful and sensitive and attentive in the spirit, we're going to need to prioritize the kingdom of God and his righteousness over everything else in our lives. And I promise you this, if you're bold enough and brave enough to pause and to pray, then you had better have God and his kingdom at the top of your priority list. Because here's what's going to happen when you pause and you pray, he's going to use you. See, this priest and this Levite in our story were not a neighbor to the man in need. They didn't pause, they didn't pray, and thus they didn't prioritize his needs. They didn't even pause and stop to consider helping. They just passed right on by on the other side. They had other priorities. They had other things they were on their way to, it seems. But this Samaritan was willing to put others before himself. He was willing to alter his schedule and to go out of his way to help. So Jesus then asked the expert in the law, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. And then Jesus told him, go and do the same. A godly neighbor is mindful of those around them. They have attentive hearts May we go and do the same. The next attitude of a godly neighbor is mercy. I put next to that word or next to that blank, a heart for the hurting. You've got to be somebody who has mercy. Mercy is, here's what mercy is. You might want to write this down in the margin of your Bible or there in your notes, but mercy is putting our mindfulness into action. Mercy is taking what you've seen and doing something about it. It, Mercy is putting your mindfulness into action. It's having a heart for the hurting. It's having a heart for what we see or perceive in the world. And, And mercy is a prominent part of being a good neighbor. It's at the center of this story. Look at it with me again in verse 31 through 34. A priest happened to be going down the road when he saw him. Circle that word, underline that word. He saw him. He passed by on the other side, though. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, circle that word, he saw him, but he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine, and then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. All three of the men that Jesus mentions here saw the man in need. I double-checked it in my Greek New Testament And the same word for saw is used in all three instances. So all three perceive the need. They all knew by perception that this man needed help, but two of them never acted on it. They all three saw him, but two had no mercy on him. You see, a godly neighbor sees, but a godly neighbor also does. They perceive and then they act. They notice and then they move to meet the need. When Jesus said, go and do the same, action is a part of that expectation. In what we call the Beatitudes, Jesus said this. He said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The word Jesus uses for mercy here, elias, means compassionate kindness. But it's not just compassionate kindness, it's compassionate kindness that leads to action. It's hard to make a case 
that we have shown or been merciful to anyone if we haven't acted as the Spirit showed us. They saw him, those two saw him, but they didn't act. They were not merciful. They showed no compassion. Was it not also Jesus who said, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful in Luke 6, 36? In James chapter 2, James talks about how we see people, how we view people, and how we treat other people, how we show them compassion. And at the end of that discussion, James makes this powerful point, saying this in verse 12 of James 2, speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. Our Father is a Father of mercy. Our Savior demonstrated the ultimate act of mercy by dying on the cross for your sins and mine and for the sins of the entire world. And as disciples of Jesus, we're called to take on the right godly attitude as a neighbor. We're called to take on the right godly attitude as a neighbor and live in this world and do what Jesus says here. We're called to go and do the same. And that means having mercy and compassion. I have no doubt that means being people of mercy and grace. In a world that is so full of judgment, in a world that's so full of hate and selfishness and pain and tragedy and suffering and hardship, in a world like that, don't you think we could use a little more compassion and mercy and grace? In a world like that, I pray that we, the church, would be the light of Christ, the light of the world, the light of Jesus, and we would not just see, but we would act. We would practice mercy. We would put our mindfulness into action. And then here's the third and the final thing, third and final characteristic or quality of a godly neighbor. It's the word ministry. And next to ministry, I put these three words, a restoring presence, because that's what ministry is. I know when y'all hear the word ministry, a lot of y'all are like, but I'm not a minister. Well, yes, you are. Ministry is not just for the staff at your church. It's not just for your lay pastors and your elders. It's not just for the leadership team or the deacons. Ministry is, is not just for those who are on the stage, so to speak. Ministry is for all Christians. We are all called to minister to those around us. And, and really what ministry is, if we're going to sum it up, it's just being a restoring presence in the life of other people. Ministry can happen in so many different ways. And these ways can manifest themselves in so many different ways. Ministry, for example, can be visible or invisible. Ministry can be big or small. Ministry can be a, a one-time occurrence that happens with a stranger on the street, or it can be an ongoing, prolonged effort that God calls you to. Ministry can be direct or indirect, but all ministry points people to Jesus, and all ministry points people to the cross, and all ministry points people to the gospel. And therefore, all ministry is restorative. All ministry is restorative in some manner because the gospel is transformative and restorative. So if we are ministering to those around us, if, if we are being a restoring presence to those around us and we're pointing them to Jesus and to the cross and to the gospel, then we're being that restoring presence they need. In our text, the Samaritan ministered to this man. He ministered in some visible ways, some physical ways, some financial ways. Jesus said in verse 33, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He put his mindfulness into action. He went over to him. He bandaged his wounds in verse 34, pouring on olive oil and wine, and then he put him on his own animal. He brought him to an inn. He took care of him. 
The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Now listen, I'm not saying your ministry is going to look like this. I'm not thinking Jesus is even saying our ministries are going to look exactly like this. This is an example for us to learn from. But I do believe that each and every one of us is called to participate in some way in the ministry of God. I've been in ministry for a long time at this point. You can tell by the gray in my beard and the baldness of my head. And when it comes to ministry, I think there are are three main reasons why most people don't ever do it. Why most people struggle with it. When I, when I say that, I'm saying all of us struggle with this. I say we, because in saying we, I include me. This is a struggle. Ministry is a struggle. It's hard. Can I tell you why ministry is hard? I mean, we see it here in our text. Number one, it's hard because it's messy. Ministry is so messy, y'all. I mean, ministry, being a restorative presence in somebody's life, it is rarely straightforward. It is rarely simple. It is rarely clean and tidy and, and easy. It's generally messy. That's illustrated so well here in our passage when Jesus says he went over to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Y'all, that was a hands-on, messy experience. The text tells us this man had been left for dead. Jesus paints a dire, gruesome picture of someone who was gravely wounded on the side of the road. And this man, with his own hands, bandaged his wounds, stopped the bleeding, cared for his needs. If you've ever been in a situation like that where you've had to help somebody who was in critical condition, bleeding from multiple areas of their life, battered and bruised and barely hanging on, you can imagine the stress of it. It was messy. I hear people all the time, and I've even said it myself to my own shame, but I hear people all the time saying, I just don't want to get involved in that. It's too messy. Yeah, because it's ministry. And ministry is messy. And if you want to serve God and if you want to minister to anyone, at some point it's going to get messy. On my Pastor Pete Facebook page this past week, I, I, I put up a picture, a video of some guys trying to help a deer who's in a bad situation. And, you know, as soon as they help the deer, he turns around and he gores two of them. And I said, that's kind of what it feels like being a pastor right? You help somebody, you save their life. I mean, this deer is literally going to die. He's dragging death around with him. And then he gets set free. And the first thing he does when he gets set free is he just starts goring these guys. It's messy. It's hard. And sometimes helping hurts. And sometimes those who help get hurt. It's called ministry. That's why people don't want to do it. As my dad always says, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But it's not easy. And so few do it. Second reason is this. Ministry is not just messy. It's also inconvenient. Notice in the text it said that he put him on his own animal, his own donkey. And he brought him to an inn to take care of him. Now there's a lot of inconvenience there. Number one, he put him on his own animal that he was presumably riding or hauling his own cargo and merchandise with. So this probably left the Samaritan to walk, possibly left him leaving some of his goods on the side of the road to save this man's life. Either way, it's inconvenient. Then he had to go and find an inn to put this man and take care of him. And then the first words of verse 35, you might underline these. These are a good reminder for us. It says the next day, three words. But there's a lot said in those three words, the next day. Y'all, he spent an entire day and an entire night ministering to this wounded man. Does that sound very convenient? Of course not. 
And ministry is never convenient. If we're going to be a church that ministers to our community, if we're going to be a church full of godly neighbors that ministers to those around us, then we have to understand it's going to be inconvenient. Finally, if being messy and inconvenient isn't enough to scare you off, here's the third reason why most people never get involved in ministry. It's because ministry is costly. It's expensive. This man was attentive to the needs of others. He chose to get involved. He put his mindfulness into action, which translated into compassion. And then he ministered to this man. And as a result, look at what happens. What does he get for it? Well, it cost him a lot. It says the next day he took out two denarii. He gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. And when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Sure, we can see the the visible costs there. We can see that it cost him money. That's easy to see. We can see that that he, being a good neighbor and being a good person, said, you know what? I'm going to pay for whatever this costs. Just take care of him until I come back and, and I'll pay you. But you know what? It also cost him his time, didn't it? The next day, remember? It cost him his effort. It might have cost him a business meeting or perhaps a transaction. It might have cost him a dinner with his family, a night in his own bed. But it cost him. Ministry will always cost you something. If we want to be godly neighbors, we better be ministry-minded And again, in Jesus' words, that means we have to go and do the same. Church, I don't know about you, but when I'm gone, when I go to glory, I don't want people to remember me like those memorable neighbors on TV. I don't want them to remember me as the crazy Cosmo Kramer. I don't want them to remember me as the annoying Kimmy Gibbler. I don't want them to even remember me as the funny Fred and Ethel or the dopey Joey or even the wise and helpful Mr. Wilson. In fact, when I'm gone, I don't really want people to remember me at all. I pray they remember Jesus. I pray that they remember how I encouraged them. I pray that they remember how I stopped to listen to them, even when I was busy. I pray that they remembered how I inspired them to do something they wouldn't have done otherwise. I pray that they remember some piece of advice I gave them that equipped them to take the next step in their journey. I pray that they remember I pointed them to Jesus. I don't just want to be a good neighbor. I want to be a godly neighbor. A godly neighbor who is mindful, merciful, and ministry-oriented throughout all the days of my life. And you know what that really comes down to, y'all? It just comes down to doing what Jesus said there right at the end. Go and do the same. Imagine if we all did that this week, if we just went and did the same. Mm, The impact we could have as godly neighbors on our world. For those of you who are here today and you don't know Christ, you're not saved. For those of you who don't know what would happen if today was the day you died, if it was your last day on earth, Can we just pause for one moment and go back to where this all began with the expert of the law? Go back to that very first word we read, what led to this whole discussion. When this expert of the law asked this question, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question, isn't it? The answer to that is you must repent, you must believe, and you must confess You must call upon the name of Jesus, for his name is the only name that can save you. His blood is the only blood that can wash your sins away. It's the only substance in all of the world, in all of creation, that can wash your sins away. It's the blood of Jesus. 
You must repent, believe, and confess if you want to be saved. If you want to have eternal life, his name is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And before you discount Jesus, can I remind you that he came to this earth and was our neighbor? Have you ever thought about that? That God sent Jesus to earth to be the most godly neighbor anybody could ever have. He walked among us for 33 years. I love this passage. I'm going to close with this. I love this passage in Hebrews chapter 2 because it shows us how neighborly Jesus was. That he came and walked among us and with us as our neighbor so we could be saved. In Hebrews 2, 14 through 17, it says, Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death, For it is clear that he does not reach out and help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus is the only way your sins can be atoned for I would encourage you today to repent, to believe, and to confess, and then to go and do the same. Let's pray. If you are here this hour and have never given your life to Jesus, we invite you to do so, not by raising your hand or coming to the front. but by praying a prayer of repentance to God, by calling on Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that's you, would you just pray with me and say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would transform me. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy, and for your willingness to come to this planet, to walk among us in flesh and blood, and to die for me on the cross. Thank you. Father, as we close today, I pray, Lord, that we will go and do the same. That we would go and be godly neighbors this day, this week, this month, and for the rest of our lives. That we would be mindful, merciful, ministry-oriented neighbors to the world that is around us. Father, that we would be your hands and feet, that people would see you through the way we live. Father, we thank you for dying for us, and I pray that you would empower us to go and do the same this week, to die for you to carry our cross so that others might know and see. Lord, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for being a part of our online family and joining us for this message that God put on my heart. I pray that it blesses you. I want to ask you if you could just do three quick, simple, easy, free things for me right away. If you haven't already, number one, hit the subscribe button. Number two, hit the thumbs up or like button if you feel like this video, this sermon is worthy of that. And number three, 
If God blesses your heart with this message, leave an encouraging word. Just leave an encouraging comment or a thought down there in the comment section. We would appreciate that so much. Thank you for being a part of our family, for joining us uh, here for this message.